Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. You may be seated. Our scripture comes from Hebrews verse, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, chapter 2, 5 to 12. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he has also created the world. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being, and he sustains all things by his powerful word. When he made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Now God did not subject the, coping, the coming world about which we are speaking to angels, but someone has testified somewhere, what are human beings that you are mindful of them or mortals that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels. You have crowned them with glory and honor, suggesting all things under their feet. Now in subjecting all things to them, God left nothing outside their control. As it is, we do not yet see everything in subjection to them, but we do see Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. It was fitting that God, for whom and through, all, through whom all things exist in bringing many children to glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one Father. For this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. Here ends the reading. come to our moment of prayer. Apparently, I have the only microphone that's working today, so I guess that's a good thing, but it'll get worked on. It'll get fixed, so um, as we come to our moment of prayer, you know, there are, there are people and circumstances that we wish to lift up this morning. Uh, uh, one in particular, um, I heard about a shooting in Houston, um, at a school in Houston a couple of days ago, and so we lift up the victims and the, the families of those victims in prayer. Um, uh, we think of uh, the fires that still rage in California. You don't hear about them on the news anymore, uh, but uh, they're still destroying land and destroying homes and destroying lives. Um, Arlen, I'm glad to see you back, buddy. Uh, we're glad you're back. I was worried about you. I don't know about anybody else, but I was. Well, I prayed for you. and. Uh, 
<laughs> there are many others, yes. I definitely. John's grandson Teddy is cancer free, 22 months old. Okay, no problem. We celebrate that. Yes. All the triplets went home this Monday. Stephen's cousin and their triplets. That's great news to hear. Well, yeah, we pay for we pray for their parents, um, uh, but uh, you know it's. Uh, I don't know. You know, I was the oldest of three, although my, my mom didn't have them at, uh, all at one time. But Mandy, my brother-in-law's girlfriend, and also my niece, Gray, is, uh, are, are both can- uh, COVID-free now. Uh, we had been praying for them for a couple of weeks, so... Happy to hear that, and of course we, we think about all those that are still affected by uh, by COVID, uh, by its effects, uh, by the uh, the circumstances we find ourselves in uh, due to the pandemic. Are there any other prayers? Let us go to our God in prayer this morning. God, in this moment, we lift up these names and circumstances to you, knowing that in our human inexperience and failures we do our best and God there are just times when it it, uh, requires you to step in and and take care of it Lord for these moments we ask that you grant those periods of patience and comfort and guidance as these people struggle through their circumstances And as we struggle along with them as people of your word, we ask all this in your son's holy name. Amen.
Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Exodus, chapters 2, verses 23 to 25, chapter 3, verses 1 to 15, and chapter 4, verses 10 to 17. Listen for the word of the Lord. After a long time, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned under their slavery and cried out. Out of the slavery, their cry for help rose up to God. God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God looked upon the Israelites, and God took notice of them. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Jesus said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people whom are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this my title for all generations. But Moses said to the Lord, O my Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor even now that you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Then the Lord said to him, Who gives speech to mortals, who makes them mute or deaf, seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you are to speak. But he said, O my Lord, please send someone else. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, What of your brother Aaron, the Levite? I know that he can speak fluently. Even now he is coming to meet you. And when he sees you, his heart will be glad. 
You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth, and will teach you what you shall do. He indeed shall speak for you to the people. He shall serve as a mouth for you, and you shall serve as God for him. Take in your hand this staff with which you shall perform the signs. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, we are continuing our People in the Neighborhood series. And, uh, you know, we heard about the, the ultimate community developer, uh, God. We uh, have heard about Abraham and Isaac, young Isaac. We've heard about old Isaac and his wife, Rebecca, and, uh, our, uh, and their two sons, Jacob and Esau. And today we get to Moses. And I have to say that when I realized that I was preaching on Moses, I best not look like him. And so the beard is gone, guys. But we start off every every part of the every part in this uh, series with uh, the little song. Who are the people in your neighborhood? You ready? Oh, who are the people in your neighborhood? In your neighborhood? In your neighborhood? Say. Are the people in your neighborhood? They're the people that you meet each day. Uh, you know, if you ever uh, know the words to that, you're quite welcome to sing along. Uh, I heard some voices over here. You know, one story, uh, today's story, begins like a movie. In fact, I think one or two movies have addressed this exact scene. The Hebrew people have been in Egypt for over 400 years and have become enslaved by the Egyptians. Moses is born at a time when the Egyptians were afraid that the Hebrew population was getting too big and they sought to kill all the male Hebrew children to prevent this from happening. God had other plans, though, and Moses is saved by Pharaoh's daughter, who, in turn, secretly enlists the help of Moses' own mother to care for him. Although Moses is a Hebrew, he's raised in Egypt's royal family as the grandson of Pharaoh. His revulsion to injustice erupted into a lethal attack on on an Egyptian man he found beating a Hebrew worker. And this act came to Pharaoh's attention, so Moses fled for safety, and he becomes a shepherd in Midian a region several hundred miles east of Egypt on the other side of the Sinai Peninsula. We do not know exactly how long he lived there, but during that time he married and had a son. In addition, two important things happened. The king in Egypt died, and the Lord heard the cry of his oppressed people and remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This act of remembering did not mean that God had forgotten about his people. It just signaled that he was about to act on their behalf. And for that, he would call Moses. God's call to Moses came while Moses was at work taking care of his father-in-law's sheep. The account of how this happened comprises six elements that form a pattern that's evident in the lives of other leaders and prophets in the Bible. It's therefore instructive for us to examine this call narrative and to consider its implications for us today especially in the, our, in the context of our work for God's kingdom. First, God confronted Moses and arrested his attention at the scene of the burning bush. Now, I can say that confrontation is something most of us try to avoid because it usually has a negative or a hostile implication. When we are confronted, it's usually something that we're not prepared for, which automatically puts us in a defensive posture from the outset. But as we see here, it's not always like that. God has this way of confronting us so so much so that we are drawn into the scene. A brush fire in the semi-desert is nothing exceptional. But Moses was intrigued by the nature of this particular one. I don't know about you, but I personally have had three specific responses to burning bushes. Number one. I've leaped around, excited at the thought that I was helping my dad build a campfire and he let me throw a stick in it. Number two, I've retreated from the scene uh, for fear that I would get blamed for my friend playing with matches. And number three, I've poured water or dirt on it in order to to prevent the spread 
of a potentially dangerous and destructive fire. Moses, though, sees this burning bush and wonders, what in the world is going on over here? And in a sense, he's being a little nosy, like so many rubberneckers who slow down to catch sight of where all that black smoke is coming from. Can you imagine the look on his face when, as he's looking at this flaming bush that is not being consumed, he hears a voice coming from it? I recall a movie in the late 1980s called The Three Amigos, which starred Chevy Chase, Steve Martin, and Martin Short. They're on a quest to find a person called the Invisible Swordsman, who has a bit of, a, a bit of wisdom to share with them along their journey, but... First, before they can find the invisible swordsman, they have to find something called the singing bush. They find the singing bush, which happens to be singing a series of show tunes and well-known children's songs like she'll be coming around the mountain when she comes. Upon seeing the bush, they ask the singing bush to identify itself, yet it continues to sing. They finally surmise that this must be the singing bush. I don't know how many singing bushes there could have been out there. The movie's not that great. I would never forgive myself if you watched it based on any recommendation coming from me. But I digress. In our text, before he can ask the identity of the bush, Moses hears his name called from it and responds, Here I am. Now this is a phrase that we have heard from every neighbor we have thus encountered in this sermon series. God demonstrated his presence in creation. He didn't say exactly, here I am, but I mean, let there be light. Bam! I, I think that says, here I am. Abraham responded with the words, here I am, when God called him to be tested, and again when the boy Isaac called to his father. Esau responded to the elder Isaac with these words, while Jacob used them to deceive his father. And now we hear the words, here I am, from the mouth of Moses. This is a statement of availability, not location. Second, the Lord introduced himself as the God of the patriarchs and communicated his intent to rescue his people from Egypt and to bring them into the land that he had promised Abraham. Now, if I came upon a burning bush that suddenly called out my name, I would have hightailed it out of there because something unnatural was happening. I said, certainly would not have answered back, let alone stayed around to hear the bush tell me who it was. But we hear throughout Scripture this identification that God proclaims to people who are being called to do specific tasks for Him. And in that sense, I am no different. When called to the ministry, I did not necessarily hear a voice from a bush telling me that it was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But it was made abundantly clear to me that the God I was being called to serve was the God of Tommy, Hazel, Harvey, and Sarah Margaret, my grandparents. Everyone that had gone before me had a purpose in my being in this exact place at this exact time. It was not coincidence that God called to me through the pointing finger of a man at the far end of a row of chairs attending the same retreat for which I had only been asked to be a chauffeur. God calls to us from a place that first catches our attention and then introduces us to the divine. Third, God commissioned Moses to go to Pharaoh to bring God's people out of Egypt. Again, I cannot help but think of what my reaction would be to a bush now telling me to go back to where I ran away from and rescue those that are left behind. Now, as a soldier, I would have never questioned a superior officer's order to fulfill a mission, especially a rescue mission. However, if I had remained in front of a bush for this long, listening to the bush identify itself and then hear it tell me to go to a dangerous place, risking my life and livelihood and to bring back a group of people that had no clue who I even was anymore, I would probably have passed. There are much more qualified people to do this. Heck, one of the sheep in this flock might stand a better chance than me of accomplishing that task. And that is exactly what happens to Moses. Fourth, he objects. 
Although he had just heard a powerful revelation of who was speaking to him in this moment, his immediate concern was, who am I? Remember, he just said, here I am. And now he questions, who am I? So often we think of ourselves in these moments of challenge. I can remember having conversations with Karen and eventually with my daughter Megan and my parents and my mother-in-law and various church leaders and mentors. It's human nature to think of ourselves. We see society today taking that mentality to an extreme. Now, I am a member of the X generation, those who, that uh, just do it and ask questions later. But then came Generation Y, and then Generation Z, and then the Millennials, and now we've reached Generation Me. I grew up believing in the band of brothers, which then became the few and the proud, and finally, an army of one. God made us all special and unique, and that individuality is what makes us work so well together, because what I lack in hearing, I exude in loving. And so it goes with all of us here and all of us out there. When we've reached the point of thinking, I am alone, we need something else. We need someone else. And God is more than willing to oblige. Now in response of this, fifth, God reassures Moses with a promise of God's own presence. God saying, here I am. Being reassured is often all it takes to change our attitude from impossible to probable. And when that reassurance comes from God, we can take the attitude from probable to absolutely. One of the things the church is called to do is to edify one another. That means to lift each other up, to reassure one another. And we do so through the spirit of love that has been placed within each of us from a loving God that has asked us to share that love. So when we reassure one another, we are in fact being obedient to God's wishes. Finally, God spoke of a confirming sign. God provides confirmation of his promises through our acts of worship and praise. In the book of Acts, there is a story of Peter and John that are being arrested, you know, just one of several times. A leader in the temple, Gamaliel, who just happens to have been a teacher of the Apostle Paul, is explaining to his peers what he thinks should happen to these two disciples. They want the highest punishment available to be given to the two disciples because of their preaching. Gamaliel, however, tells them that they should be let go. His reasoning, if what they're preaching is false, it'll eventually die away. But if it is truly from God, there is absolutely nothing that they can do to stop it. Even through torture, or death. We today have received that confirmation that God's promises have come and will come true. Part of it has to do with the lives that we've already led. The rest is based on our faith. Our faith is that confirmation. Now in the case of Moses, the process becomes somewhat of a decision-making algorithm tree for some of you scientists out there because Moses still has objections the process reverts back to that point, in which case another round of reassurance and confirmation from God thus applies. This time, it's not that he's the wrong person for the job, but rather that he does not have the right voice for the job. Listen to my voice. It sounds a little nasally, has a little bit of a drawl, and it sometimes sounds as if I'm mumbling, although I promise you I don't do it intentionally. Yet God allows me to have at least a little thread of music ability. Most of you have heard my daughter sing. I think she has the most beautiful voice in the world. But what if I were to tell you that her first passion was not singing, but rather playing the cello? She was a brilliant cello player. She was so good, in fact, that at one point we thought she would end up studying string performance in college and make a career of playing the cello. When she decided that she felt that teaching people to sing was what she felt called. 